Well, the coming of Jesus was marked with songs of great joy. Somebody once said that when Jesus came into the world, poetry expressed itself and music was reborn. Let's listen now to the familiar story of the angels and the shepherds and the message that came to them through the the song of the angels that they sang to these shepherds and through them to the whole world. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were filled with fear. The angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, Gloria in its Chelsea's due. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is well pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw it, They made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told them. Well, now, the angels, which, of course, are everywhere in our Christmas cards and decorations, they appear, don't they, as a a picture of innocence and harmless sentimentality. So you might wonder why on earth these shepherds we read about were utterly terrified when angels appeared to them, sore afraid, as the old version puts it. Sudden dread filled their troubled minds, says the carol. Well, of course, the reason is that real angels as the Bible describes them, are an entirely different thing from the sentimental nonsense that we get in our Christmas decorations. What these tough country farmers saw that night, says Luke, was a multitude of the heavenly hosts, the heavenly armies. That's who the heavenly hosts were, a vast army bristling with the weapons of war. It was rather like today, suddenly the flashlights of helicopters went on and filled the air with visions of special forces bristling with all kinds of modern weapons and shouting at you through a megaphone. That was really what happened to them. And you also would be sore afraid, let me tell you. So would I. In fact, the gulf between the the popular imagination of angels and the reality illustrates the gulf between... Well, it's really just a a sentimental sentimental fantasy that we tend to uh, paint about Christmas and the reality that the Bible actually tells us about. We tend to say, don't we, that Christmas is all about peace and goodwill. And we do our best, don't we, to, to create a feeling of that at Christmas. And we can do it. We can do it for a fleeting moment with the candles and the the tree lights and the mistletoe and the wine and choir boys in dresses singing lovely descants in cathedrals and so on. But it's fleeting, isn't it? It's not real. We all remember that story, don't we, about the trenches in World War I and how on Christmas Day, so the story goes, the British and the German troops came out into no man's land and had a game of football playing together. But the very next day, they were back in the trenches, blowing each other to smithereens. And in a sense, that's a bit how family Christmases might be for any family with young children. By the end of tomorrow, they'll be exhausted, overfed, overtired, fighting each other for the new presents, and all kinds of chaos will ensue. 
But on a, on a more serious note, that actually is the reality about our world, isn't it? Real peace, peace, peace between nations, within nations, that is something far, far more elusive than can be provided for with a few wistful feelings and some mince pies. Real peace is hard to come by. Peace in a fractured marriage can't be restored by a few extravagant presents and a bit of mistletoe, can it? That's just fantasy. It's sentimentality to think that. And you see, the Bible, when you really read it, it's not sentimental at all. Not ever. It's full of stark realism. It tells us about the world as it really is. It never, ever lets us play, let's pretend, and let's hide from the truth. No, the Bible offers a real explanation of the world that actually fits the facts of our experience in life. The Bible deals with real evidence about life. I know it's becoming unfashionable today in many circles to think about evidence. Real evidence is being sidelined. We don't need evidence anymore. Apparently, we just need experts to tell us what to believe about nearly everything, whether it's the science or whether it's medicine or biology or climate or whatever it is. We need to believe what the experts tell us so we're not on the wrong side of history, we're told. But the Bible is much more concerned that we should be on the right side of reality. And the reality is that ours is not a world full of the pipes of peace. Ours is a world full of strife and full of disorder and full of violence. Our world is not a wistful world full of, of gladness and laughter all the time. It's often a world that's filled with great sadness, with real pain. And we sense deep down, don't we, that the world should be different. That peace and, and joy and harmony should be the things that reign in our world. And that's why we dream, that's why we fantasize, because we can imagine something so different from the reality that we experience. And it does exist, at least in the conception of our minds and our hearts. But you see, the evidence all around us tells us we can't pretend that the world is other than it really is. And that's the basic perplexity that lies at the heart of so much human angst. It's why we ask that question so often. Why? Why? Why is there such violence and war and hatred in the world? Why can't families live in peace? Why can't marriages not break down? Why does that child have cancer? Why does that young man have a brain tumor? See, the Bible won't let us play, let's pretend. Let's pretend that everything is lovely and pain-free. It tells us the truth. It tells us the world in a mess. But it also explains why it's in that mess. And it points us to the only real solution, which is not a fantasy of let's pretend. We're in the mess we're in as human beings because the Bible tells us we are living in a civil war with our maker. We've turned our back unilaterally on God. We've, we've shut out his glory from his world with predictably disastrous consequences. As we heard read a little earlier, the Apostle Paul puts it like this. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. But became futile in their thinkings. And their futile hearts were darkened. We've shut God out. And so God has turned his benevolent face away from us. Paul says, God gave humanity up to dishonorable passions, to debased minds. And as a result of that, he says, we inhabit a world which is filled with all manner of envy, murder, strife, maliciousness. People are boastful, he says, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Not much sentimental fantasy there, is there? But that is pretty much what you saw in today's news. And what it describes is all the, the disordered relationships of our world on a personal level, on a national level, on a global level. And it all comes back to the root cause, which is a disordered relationship with God, our maker, who is the sovereign Lord of the world. 
Human beings, the apostle says, are responsible for it all. We are without excuse, he says. But God has judicially done it. God has given the world up. He's given it up to the vanity and to the power of man. We wanted to run the world our way. And this is the world that we have made for ourselves. We made a thoroughly good job of wrecking the world. But here's the problem. We have proved totally unable to fix it. Politicians can't fix it, that's for sure. The police can't fix it. No amount of laws that politicians pass or the police enforce can reverse evil, can they? They might restrain it a little bit, if they're good laws, that is. But there are bad laws too, aren't they? And they just add to the evil. Now, only an act of God can actually put this world to rights. A divine intervention is needed if ever the primary problem is to be addressed. The problem of the wrecked relationship we have with God himself. But according to these fearsome angels, in the coming of Jesus into our world, that is what has begun. And what those terrified shepherds that night were going to learn is that in the very birth of Jesus is good news of great joy for all the people of this fractured and broken world. It's quite extraordinary, really, when you think about it, that an event which passed almost unnoticed on the whole earth set the whole of heaven ablaze with song. But that's what happened. So it's worth us looking at the angel song just to see what the joy of these fearsome heavenly soldiers was actually all about. First of all, it was about real rejoicing in heaven. Above all, they proclaimed a message of glory to God in the highest. Gloria in excelsis Deo, as we sometimes sing. And what they're singing about is God acting to bring himself back into the center of this world forever. So that again, he will have the preeminence in everything. The Christian message is is first and foremost the message about God. It's about God being vindicated in the eyes of the whole world and being seen to be the God of glory that he actually is. Some people are very mistaken. They think Christianity is centered on people. That it's really a, a, a crutch for feeble people who who need something to believe in to help them through life and the difficulties of life who who sort of need a big Santa Claus in the sky to answer their prayers to bring fulfillment to their lives and so on that's like the real Christmas message is the absolute antithesis of that it's about the true God the only God showing himself to be the true and only Lord of glory in this world in a world that's rejected him And far more importantly, even in a world which God himself has distanced himself from because of our rebellion. The Christmas message is good news, first of all, because it's a message about God coming back into the center of his world. And not leaving our world's story to end in total disaster. It's ironic, really, isn't it? Because in many ways today, Christ is almost airbrushed right out of Christmas. I googled Christmas the other day, and all the first things that came up were trees and songs and decorations and presents, but nothing about Christ. Now, we might complain about that, but by the way, the angels weren't complaining, were they? The angels weren't coming and starting a petition to Parliament to say, please, can't we put God back into Christmas? No, no, no. They are proclaiming the fact that God himself has acted to put himself right back into the center of this world. He has done it. Even if no one on earth even noticed, apart from a few peasants, apart from a few shepherds out in Palestine. And in doing so, he has glorified himself in the highest. And all the host of heaven can see it and are singing about it because they see what the coming of Christ will really mean for this world. There is real rejoicing in heaven in Jesus birth because through Jesus and through him alone there will at last be real reconciliation on earth there is peace that's what this warrior army of angels are shouting peace among those with whom God is pleased now 
Now, that has nothing to do with a, a seasonal bonhomie over mulled wine and mince pies. This is the real peace that follows only where God has his rightful place in the world, where he is Lord over all the people of this world. But you see, for, for an estranged people, for people who are in revolt against God, that peace can only come after something, after real reconciliation, can't it? And we all know how hard real reconciliation is, especially in the face of terrible crime, terrible injustice. You can't just airbrush injustice away. You can't just play, let's pretend. Let's pretend I wasn't robbed. Let's pretend you weren't beaten up. Let's pretend she wasn't assaulted and raped. Let's pretend I wasn't cheated on in my marriage and so on. You can't do that. You can't pretend into reconciliation. There's a real cost in true reconciliation if it's ever going to happen. And you know how costly that is, don't you? If you've ever had to forgive somebody for something really huge, it's very, very costly. Like often it's so costly you just can't forgive. That's why very often relationships are poisoned permanently. Isn't that right? You cannot forgive. It's just too costly. Well, God himself is the abused party in every way in our world. And so only he can ever bear the cost of that forgiveness and bring reconciliation that's real to human beings. And yet the message of the angels is God is the great reconciler. He has come as Savior to bring real reconciliation. For unto you is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. God had said long ago through his prophet Isaiah, I am the Lord. Besides me, there is no Savior. Only God can ever sort out the real mess in this world. But now he's saying, in the birth of the long-promised Messiah, the Christ, the King in David's line, now God himself has come to be that Savior. He came in human flesh to make peace between God and man. To bring that real reconciliation. And yes, it was at a great, great cost. A terrible cost because justice cannot be ignored. Sin must be punished. But Jesus Christ was born, the Bible tells us, to bring peace through making peace through the blood of his cross. God himself came as Savior. And to bear in himself, in human flesh, the awful consequences of human sin. And he did it so that he might reconcile rebellious human beings to himself in love. So no wonder the angels are singing songs of joy and glory. Even they marvel at what God's doing. God's mighty heavenly army is looking on at this whole scene in absolute wonderment. Instead of God commanding his army to go and destroy human rebellious enemies, God himself is entering this horrible, hostile, evil world to give his own blood to reconcile these enemies to himself. What kind of God is that? Well, it's not the God of terrorists and suicide bombers is it it's not the spirit who animates wanton taking of life for glory no this is the true God this is the God of the Bible this is the living God who created the world and who so loved the world even in its bitter hostility to him so loved the world that he gave his only son so that there would be real reconciliation through real costly forgiveness for rebellious human beings and that's why you see the, the message of the angels is so important and it can't be ignored not just by the shepherds then but, but not by anyone ever because it's so magnificent it is so vast it is the greatest revelation of God there ever can be in this world so to ignore it would be such a monumental refusal of reality, well, that could only lead to total and complete disaster. 
There is real rejoicing in heaven because God the Savior has come. And there is real reconciliation on earth through the blood of Jesus, which is costly and terrible and yet utterly wonderful. And so there must be also a real response. A real response in time and in history from every single one to whom this message is sent. God sends his message of peace into this world for a response. There can't be peace, can there, with somebody who refuses peace. Peace has got to be accepted. Reconciliation is something that that must be entered into, responded to. We know that. There's no such thing, is there, as, as reconciliation in theory. Real reconciliation is about re-entering a relationship so that it's restored, so that it's renewed, so that it becomes real again. It can't be any other way than that. And so it is with God's peace. God is gracious. God is merciful. He is infinitely merciful. But he's not soft. He's not sentimental. Certainly not unjust. He offers peace, but it must be received, must be welcomed. His peace is for those with whom he is pleased, says the angel. Not because they're better people than anybody else. They earn his favor. Not at all. No, but because they're humble people. They're people who will receive his favor. People who who respond in obedient faith to God's marvelous reconciling work in Jesus Christ. The message of Christ, the message of Christmas calls for that response, a personal response, an urgent response, a response before it's too late. And those words of the angels, they're still prophetic. You see, the peace that they speak about will one day fill this whole world. Be in no doubt of that. When the Lord Jesus comes again, he promised that his people will inherit this earth. And he will reign and he will establish his peace cosmically forever. But then, then he's not coming to offer peace. He'll be coming to establish it by the force of his ultimate judgment. He will judge the nations, declares the prophet Isaiah. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their shields into pruning hooks. And neither shall they learn war any more. And that's another verse, you know, that's been sentimentalized away into sort of wistful hopes about the brotherhood of man one day. No, no, no. That is a picture of abject surrender. The powers of this world throwing down their weapons before the Christ, the King of glory, when he comes to judge this whole world. And that day is coming, friends. That day is coming maybe much sooner than any of us think. But on that day, it will be too late. It will be too late to respond to the offer of peace from God. Jesus himself tells us that on that day, those who have not received his offer of peace now will be swept away forever in a terrible flood of judgment. He tells us that in his own lips. Now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation, says the Bible. On that day, it will be too late. And that's why Luke wrote this gospel for his readers, for us. If you've never read it, take one from the back and I'd be glad for you to have it and read it. It's a message to bring rejoicing. It's a message about real reconciliation, but it is a message that demands a real response now, before it's too late. And what he's saying to us in this episode here that he's recorded, that we've read tonight... He's saying, look, look how these shepherds responded when they heard the news. Do as they did because they got it right. You see what they did? They came, didn't they? They came personally. Let us go, they said. Let's go and see this thing that the Lord has revealed to us. They were humble enough to know that they needed a savior that the angels were speaking about. And many people, you know, today, many people are too proud to think that they need a savior God will accept me as I am I don't need any of that stuff 
Yes, you do, says the Lord. There's no other way to be pleasing to God than by submitting your life to the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. You must come personally, penitently to God through Jesus. There is no other way. They came personally, and notice also they came urgently. Let us make haste. They wasn't putting it off. Now, that's another stumbling block, isn't it, for many people, especially young people. Oh, there's plenty of time for all that later on when I'm older. You better be very, very sure of that, haven't you? I'll never forget one year, the day before Christmas Eve, when I had to bury an 18-year-old student who just a few days before had been hale and hearty and healthy. A terrible Christmas. None of us know, do we, how much more time God has given us, how much we have left. But what we do know is that God has sent a message from heaven itself, a message of real reconciliation. And we can have with him, before it's too late, to bring rejoicing with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is a message for receiving. It's not a message for rejecting. I hope you've all received Christ. I hope you've all here tonight receive and find that wonderful joy. But if not, my message to you tonight, which I have to give to you, is make haste. Don't delay. Do as the shepherds did. Come personally to him. And when you do, you will find exactly what those shepherds find. You will find that everything you discover about Jesus Christ, the Lord, is just as it has been told you through the angels and through every other wonderful word in the scriptures that God has given us. There's no fantasy. There's no let's pretend. There's only truth and reality and great, great abundant joy so may we all join the joy and the song of heaven this Christmas time Amen let's pray Almighty God give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light now in the time of this mortal life in which thy son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility that in that last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.